Okay, so uh, statistics. So um, there are quite a lot of um, uh, kind of like details and some some kind of big scary equations in this. Uh, but for the most of it, the details of those equations is not details are not important. Um, uh, so just um, just as a, a bit of a heads up, sometimes you might see this symbol for average. Okay, so sometimes. Uh, if you were going to get a bunch of numbers, add them all up, divide it by the number of numbers you have, that's the average, uh, or more specifically the mean, okay, use that symbol. Um, but alternatively, we also use, um, uh, if you've got a set uh, number of measurements of a variable x, we might call the mean x with a little line over the top. So that might be the mean of the variable x. Okay, and that's, that's what we have here. So. Uh, so these kind of maybe look, if you've not seen them before, a little bit scary, but all of this, this means is that um, if we've got lots of measurements of variable x, okay, so lots of measurements of variable x, uh, see so if I can use my clipboard, so lots of measurements of variable x, so this could be kind of the height of undergraduate students in a math, maths class, it could be the concentration of pollution in uh, Braidburn, which is just... Um, to the to the south of our um, our location right here, um, so we've got lots of measurements. Uh, so I is just the kind of the nth number of measurements. So the first measurement, the second measurement, the third measurement. So from the first measurement, so what this what this this backwards e looks like? Is that a forward weight e? Okay, this is actually a Greek sigma big S. So this just means from the first measurement until the last measurement, you add them all up. Okay. So sum, okay? Uh, and then you divide by the number of measurements that you have, okay? And that's all mean is, okay? So there are these, that, that's basically, if we had, in this example here, if we had, if we, for, for sample A, if we've measured, say sample A is the, uh, the concentration of mercury in the stream uh, as we go at the bottom of the, um, the science area. Okay. So we could make it two places. We could make it upstream, and we could measure it. We can measure it downstream. Okay. So we might want to test: is the concentration of mercury does it increase as we go past the science site? Okay. Might be test. So we could measure it upstream, and we might measure it a bunch of different times. Okay. And we might then want to say, what's the, the mean of those measurements? So we add them all up, divide them by the number of ones we have, and we might get something that's a little bit like that. Okay? But that's, that's not very useful if you wanted to compare it to some other set of measurements. We might measure downstream. We might get a different mean. Okay? But we want some way of working out what the, the spread of the data is. Okay? So we could just take the lowest and the highest, and we could make our error bar that. I mean, that would be a thing that we could do, right? That would be the whole range of the data. But as it turns out, there's a much, um, there's a much, and we'll see see why that that's not a good idea in a bit. Okay? But there's this this um, these uh, statistical measures called uh, variance, and what the variance does is it takes the difference. Okay? It looks at what the mean is, what you've calculated and then it takes each measurement and sees how far away from the mean that is. Okay, so it basically takes all of these distances here, that distance there, 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 and you just add them up, okay, and then divide by the number of measurements you've made. So it's basically the average difference from the mean, okay? And we have this, this term in here, this um, squared term in here, because if you if you actually add that difference to that difference to that difference, and then add those differences, all these differences are negative, and all those differences are positive. So if you actually added them together, you'd always get zero. Okay, so that's not very useful. But if you if you square them, okay, if you, if you times them by themselves, okay, if you times a negative number by a negative number, you'll get a positive number. You times a positive number by a positive number, you'll get a positive number. So this basically takes into account of the fact that 
if you're below average or above average and you add them together, you don't want them to cancel out. Okay? So that's the variance. Okay? But if you actually wanted the average difference from the mean, okay, you'd want to get rid of, you'd want to undo that mathematical trick that you've done when you squared it. Okay? So that's all the stat so this term standard deviation, okay, is just the average difference each measurement is from the mean. Okay? And that's quite a useful term. Um, and we'll see, see some examples of this later. So what we're looking at here is basically, if we put on our plus or minus one standard deviation, okay, so standard deviation is sometimes referred to as this Greek letter, uh, Greek letter like that, which is a, a lowercase s in Greek, okay? I'm not sure why we use lowercase s for standard deviation, probably because it begins with an s, I guess. Um, sometimes you might see this written s dot d for standard deviation, okay? So we could do that, and we could then plot our another standard deviation for our, these measurements over here. And we could see, in this case, that this number okay, is within error okay, of our other measurements. So we would then falsify the hypothesis that there's an increase in um, mercury concentration, or whatever it is, as you go past the science site. OK, so. So this is this is kind of where statistics gets a little bit um, a little bit tedious and a little bit a little bit, a little bit crazy. So um, and this is kind of the difference between what's called a population and a sample. Okay. So this is this is used quite a lot in surveying of actual populations of people. Okay. Uh, because you can't um, you can't ask everybody a question in a survey. You have to answer. A subset of people. So if there's an election on uh, and you see uh, an opinion poll, they don't ask everyone what they're going to vote. They ask a small sample of the population, okay, and then they use that to try and predict what the whole population average will be. Now, in kind of measurement science, rather than it being a population of or a number of different things or decision making bodies or whatever it is, um, you could say the population is if we measured something an infinite number of times, okay, if we made loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of measurements, okay, then if we work out the average of that, that will be the true value of that, that measurement. Okay? But uh, because in quite a lot of science, you can't make an infinite number of measurements, okay, because measurements are expensive, they take time and money, so we make a small number of measurements, Okay, so a small number of repeat measurements of the same thing, and we call that a sample of our total number of measurements. Okay, so the uh, um, and these things. So if you take a if you take a, a small sample of the whole population, okay, and you've worked out the average of, of both, you should get the same number if your sample is representative of the whole population. So if you if you if you if you take a a big enough sample, and that sample is kind of randomly distributed about the whole population of possible measurements, then you should get the same mean. Okay? But if you have a small number of measurements, okay, so for instance, if I was trying to guess on the average age of people in this room, right? Okay, if I asked all of you what your age was, okay, and then there would be there would be only one mean answer, right? Okay, but if I asked just two of you what your age was. Okay, like in days. Okay, then that wouldn't be the same number as the whole population. Okay, so that there is always some difference between measuring a feasible number of people in a sample and the whole population. Okay, so <clears throat> we uh, we have these uh, uh, these problems with this. So we we have to basically correct for that for that difference. So the population mean. Okay. Uh, and the population variance. So basically, these are the same questions, same equations as before. Okay. Uh, and the sample mean and the sample variance. So these are the same equations as before. Okay. So they are basically exactly the same thing. It's just there. This is when you measure everything, every possible measurement of concentration you could ever make in the river, or asking everybody what their age was. Whereas this is just asking a small subset of 
of that whole population of people or just a small group of measurements. Okay? So they're the same equations, okay? but they'll give you different answers. Okay, and uh, so I'll just go through an example of this. So this is basically just some random data that I've created. Okay, so uh, I created ten thousand data points, uh, and I've and I've and I've given them so basically some random noise about their mean value. Okay, so they just vary randomly about I think about twenty five. Okay, so I'm gonna basically take a small, just randomly select a small number of that whole population. So if I worked out the total average of all those 10,000 um, data points, okay, that's what this dotted line is here. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, so, I've, 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 so I've actually I've normalized it to one. So what I've done is I've taken the, um, the, the, the the average of the whole population, and I think that's kind of like 25 or something like that. And then what I've done is I've selected, I think I started off, I selected two data points, okay? And I said, what's the average of those two data points relative to the average of 35, okay? So for the first one, it was maybe a little bit low, and then I selected more data points, okay? And I got a slightly different answer because like selecting four data points, it's not going to be. I could have accidentally, like, oh, not tall enough. Uh, I could have, uh, I could have picked this point, this point, this point, and that point. It's unlikely that if I'd have chosen randomly, I'd have picked those. But you can see the mean of those points is at zero, right? And that's nowhere near the real mean, which is about twenty-five. Okay. So in that case, I would have had a number that's like way down here. Yeah. So the point of this is the more data points that you sample in your sample, okay, the closer to the true mean of the whole population you get. So when you're, when you're out here, once you get kind of like, when, if you sample 25 numbers randomly from this, this kind of cloud of data up here, okay, the mean of those 25 numbers okay, will be um, close to the mean of the whole population. Okay? If you sample fewer, not less, fewer uh, samples, okay, you're likely to have some error between your sample mean and the population mean. Okay? So this is an important point. So if you're doing measurements of something, you might want to think, if you want to actually be accurate with your measurement, you want to, looks like you want to sample at least 25 times the same thing right, to get something, a mean that's kind of close to the population um, mean. Okay, so if I wanted to get your kind of the the if I wanted to know the average age in days or the average height or something of undergraduates in Edinburgh, okay, I would have to find at least twenty five undergraduates and measure them. Okay, if I sampled fewer, then I'd likely to have some considerable error in my assessment of the mean. Now, when it comes to the variance, okay. It's not quite so simple. Okay, so the variance doesn't really show such a, uh, a coherent pattern changing with increasing sample number. Okay, and that's that's because uh, there is there is a bias. Okay, so with a sample with a sample size that's small, okay, you're more likely to underestimate the spread of, of data. Okay, and if you look at this distribution up here, you'll see the reason why. Okay, so if you have a small number of measurements, you can see that the density of this cloud of data is higher around the mean okay, than it is out here. Okay? So the more data points that you collect, okay, the more likely it is that you'll include one of these kind of really low or really high numbers. Okay? So what this means that is the more samples that you measure, the bigger the variance should get on average. I mean, it'll, it'll vary. I mean, because you're sampling randomly, sometimes it might, might go up, sometimes it might, might get down. But on average, the um, sample variance is always an underestimate of the true population variance. And that is important. Okay, so I've just, just flipped through some other. This is basically a different set of random um, like samples I've taken. You see, you get a slightly different 
kind of distribution up here, but it does kind of start to tail off and come close to the population mean as you get uh, larger sample sizes. There's another one. Um, and you see, you see, well, basically, uh, by chance, the first two samples I selected there happen to be very close to each other in terms of uh, their actual value. So we've got a very low variant, but then it kind of like goes up here. But you can always see this, this is, tends to be an underestimate, underestimation, <sighs> underest uh, less than you would expect um, the, for the variance for a sample. Okay? And if you actually do that whole thing, so if you take many, 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 random samples of the same data set and then average each of those results, um, you get something that looks like this. Okay? So for if you measure, say, five samples, okay, you'll typically, on average, you'll be underestimating the variance by 20%. Okay? If you only take two samples, you'll be underestimating the variance by 50% on average, but it could be, you know, you, there'll be a lot of noise in that. Okay. Um, so, and this 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 plot on the uh, uh, left on the left, uh, it's just to show what happens if you take uh, different sizes of, of sample. So, if I make uh, if I choose four samples and work out the mean, okay, and the variance, you get a big cloud of, of data. So, you're not really very accurate, okay. But if you sample a hundred um, samples, okay, you end up much closer to the true mean and the true variance. Okay, so just to point out that you know measuring um, stuff that is um, measuring more replicates gives you more accurate results. So uh, going back to the variance now, you can see here that there's this quite systematic <coughs> kind of underestimate under <sighs> less than expected variance for smaller and smaller sample sizes. Okay? And because this is so systematic, we can actually correct for it. So if we're measuring a sample variance, we can then predict, better predict what the whole population variance would be. Okay? Um, and this is the bias. Okay? So this is the, the true population uh, ver uh, standard deviation no, variance. sorry, And this is the sample variance. And this is basically the, describes how far you are from this one line here. So where if you sample, for instance, um, uh, two samples, n minus 1 is 1, n is 2. So the, the, the sample variance is half the um, uh, total population variance. And as n gets bigger, this number becomes closer and closer to 1, and you get closer and closer to the true variance. But because this is kind of predictable, we can just add that in. Example, we can just add that in to our equation for the, the um, uh, so this, is, this bottom equation is kind of the important one. So this is the, the population variance as estimated from a sample of the population. Okay? So these are your sample measurements. But instead of dividing by n, number of measurements you have, you just divide by n minus 1. Okay? So just bear that in mind. Um, and um, I just, I just go out. Just, so have, have any of you guys used Excel to calculate standard deviation before? Yeah? So if you have, oh, I'm not going to bring it up, but basically if you have a, let's, let's imagine this is kind of, a column of numbers in Excel, right? Okay, you could in another cell here, okay, right? You could write equals S T D E V, and then open brackets, and then like your cell reference A one to A one two seven something like that. Okay, and that would take all of the the numbers in this cell array and work out the standard deviation. Okay, now. <clears throat> Bear in mind that uh, you don't actually, well, so what this is actually doing is there are, there are two functions to work out standard deviation in Excel. There's equals s dev dot p and s dev 
dot s. Okay? So what this is doing is if you use sdev dot p, okay, that uses this equation, okay? So it uses it basically the one that that doesn't divide by n plus one. So it's basically working out the standard deviation of the population, assuming that you've given the the Excel the whole population of measurements. Okay, whereas uh, S dev dot S will um, will do this. It will assume that you've given it a sample of the total population, and it will give you the variance of the population. Okay, so <clears throat> just to point out that I think when you if you don't put the dot P or dot S, it will do the dot S one. Okay, so uh, I mean, it, it, so this number. The S dev dot P, okay, this uh, which is this equation, okay, you're dividing by n, whereas this one you're dividing by n minus one. So that means that your variance will always be bigger if you use this equation than if you use this one. So it's just something to watch out for is that you can kind of trick yourself into thinking your error bars are smaller than they, they are they are than they, they should be if you use S dev dot P when you should have used S dev dot S. But you'll, you'll come across that, hopefully, more. OK, so this is, just, um, this is just a representation of what that distribution of random data looks like. OK, so if you take that big cloud of data and you basically draw a histogram, OK, you're much more likely to get a, very, uh, a measurement that's closer to the mean than you are to further away from the mean. OK, and this is called a normal distribution. Um, uh, and it's actually very useful uh, in, um, in, in science. So basically what, what it allows you to do is to, uh, if your data actually is randomly distributed, but most likely to be the mean, okay, then you can say that if you've got plus or minus one standard deviation, okay, then kind of 60, 62 and a bit odd, um, no, what is it? Uh, uh, yeah, 60, 68% of your data is likely to be within that, that, that bound there, right? Uh, if you do two standard deviations, then you're, um, you're almost kind of like 95%, and you're just over 95% sure all of the data is within this, this region here. So what that, what that actually means is that with, if we go back to these kind of actual measurements, Okay, if we've got our, our mean, and in this case we've put two standard deviations on there, okay, what that means is that there's, if we make another measurement, okay, there's a 95% chance that it will fall between here and here. Okay? So that's quite useful to know if you're trying to determine whether uh, this number okay, is statistically different to another number. Okay? Because you can say, well, if our, our other measurement is up here, okay. So basically, because these error bars don't over, let's make them not overlap, because they don't overlap, okay. We can say, well, there's a 95% chance that these are not the same number, okay. So there are, there are actually more detailed statistical tests that you can do, but it's kind of basically a rough, kind of rough and ready. Uh, if you just plot two standard deviations either side of your data point and go. Is it the same? And if it's not the same, you can say it's not the same. If they are overlap, you can't say that you can distinguish those two numbers. <coughs> so Massimo will go over uh, more of this in kind of uh, when it gets to Massimo time. Um, 68, 95, there we go. I remember the right numbers using maths. Um, ignore that. Okay, so these are some of the, some of the functions that you're using. You'll come across these in the tutorial sheets um, uh, later on. So uh, if you don't, can't get to grips with the, that, those kind of functions of Excel, do go over those with your um, tutors, uh, which you guys have met, right? Yeah, met the tutors. Sweet. Um, okay, so I'll say a little bit about correlation, okay? So 
uh, if you've got two variables, okay, that, that so you, you, you're measuring, um, you might want to know if there is any relationship between those two variables. Okay? So, uh, for instance, I might want to measure all of the undergraduates and see if there's a relationship between height and weight. Okay? Or uh, I might want to measure some stream water chemistry and say, is there a relationship between population density and uh, pollution? in the river. Okay, some, some, something like that. Okay, um, so there's this, uh, this kind of mathematical concept called correlation. So basically, uh, something has got a good correlation if when you vary one variable, the other variable varies with it. Okay, so that would be a, a very good positive correlation. If there was no relationship at all between uh, population density and, and pollution or height and weight, you might expect there to be basically more of a cloud of data. So when you measure like a tall person, they could be just as likely to be kind of heavy as they were likely to be light. It's unlikely, but whatever. Um, and then the other kind of correlation is where there's kind of this negative correlation. Okay? So in this case, you measure someone's height, and they would actually be the taller they are, the lighter they are, which is kind of that's a, like, that's a very odd example, but it could be. Uh, oh, let's think of some example. Uh, from kind of a river water chemistry point of view, you could make a look at, if you looked at maybe um, the kind of the, the calcium concentration and pH, okay? As one goes up, the other one might come down, okay? Um, so that's correlation, and that, um, okay, that you can work out with this horrible, horrible uh, equation here, which I don't think anybody has expected you to, to know, um, but this is something that Excel can work out for you, um, but what we're basically looking at is, does the, the, the difference in the, the mean in one direction times the difference in the mean to the other direction, if you add those up, okay, so in cases of, if we're looking at, we've got, uh, if this is the mean of our data, okay, if we've got a point up here, okay, and maybe a point down here, uh, the difference in the horizontal values, that would be a positive difference, and that would be a positive, okay? So if we times those positive numbers together, we end up with a very big number up here, yeah? So that's if, if things plotted along that line, we get lots of positive plus positives. Uh, but if we are off in this direction down here, then we'd be adding a positive number, times a positive number by a negative, negative number, positive, negative number. So this term, if we had lots of positives, positives, and lots of, and an equal number of positive negatives, then that would kind of cancel each other out. Whereas if we have lots of positive positives or negative negatives, so if we've got lots of data that falls along there, this becomes a big number. If we've got data that's on here and along here, then, which basically is just a cloud of data, then all of these terms start to tend to cancel out. But don't worry about it because there's a function in Excel, coral, which basically you just give it two sets of data, some y values and some x values, and it can work out what r is. Also, if you plot a graph, okay, you draw a regression line for that graph using trend line in Excel, and you can get that statistic out. Okay, so um, so you'll, you'll come across that in the tutorials. Um, yeah, so. Just, uh, just to, I guess, to keep in mind that basically, as with um, uh, so this is the <coughs> correlation R, and if you times that by itself, so the R squared, um, you get this 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 function that basically describes how much um, how much if you had a graph of let's say. Let's be controversial. X against Y. Okay, it's a bit crazy. Um, if you had a, a graph that was with all the data looked, looked just like that, okay, so that's very well correlated. Okay, so uh, so it would have an R squared close to one. Okay, so R squared might be 90.99, and what that means is that 99% or or 100%, whatever whatever this value is. So if it's if it's one, that's 100%. That's 80%. 60% in the R squared, that means that that percentage of variance in one variable 
is described by variance in the other variable. Okay, so basically, if you're looking at how much, what, if you, if you were, if you were measuring weight and height, okay, those things might correlate with each other, and they, if they would have, say, maybe uh, a correlation coefficient of maybe something like an R squared of 0.6, that would tell you that if you knew someone's weight, you could. Basically, you have a 60% chance of getting their height right, right, by just using the regression line of that data. Okay, so 60% of the variability in height can be explained by variability in weight. Okay, or but the thing is, you don't know which way round that relationship goes, right? So it, it just tells you that those two variables are related to each other. It doesn't tell you which is causing. The, 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 that, that correlation. So people are not tall because they're heavy. Okay, it might be that they're actually heavy because they're tall. Okay, so that's one thing that's really important when you're looking at correlations. Okay, so a correlation coefficient just tells you that the data are related to each other. It doesn't tell you what is causing that kind of that relationship. So yeah, so this is that reverse causation. Thing. So, kind of examples in kind of non-science. I think the example is some. Oh yeah. So smoking leads to lower exam marks. Um, so, people that smoke. If you kind of survey people that smoke and they measure their exam marks, um, there is a correlation that more you smoke, the lower your exam marks are. Now, it's not necessarily that the smoking is causing you to be more stupid. It just might be that people that are more stupid and get lower exam marks make bad life decisions. Okay, so um, so you, it's not saying anything about the way round things go. And I think there's an example in here about fire, right? So if you go and find out if you serve, if you do a, a survey of a city from where there are fires, okay, so if you get where, which buildings are on fire, okay, and you also do a survey of where there are firefighters, okay, so there's a high correlation between you finding a fire, you're very likely to also find a firefighter. Okay? Does that, that doesn't mean that firefighters cause fires. Okay? Um, okay, so yeah, so this is kind of like this is the next example is so sometimes correlations you can you can get back to front, like the smoking and sound one, but sometimes there could be a third variable that is causing the correlation. Okay, so um, so if you go to a school and you kind of measure how well kids can read, okay, uh, it turns out that there's a really good correlation between how big their shoes are and how well they can read. Okay? And that's nothing to do with, like this shoe size has nothing really to do with how reading skills. It's because if you go to a school, there'll be kids of loads of different ages, and the kids that are older will be bigger, and they'll have more time at school to learn to read. Okay? So there's a spurious third correlation that causes there to be a direct correlation between data in two unconnected things, so shoe size and reading skills. So these kind of correlations do turn up quite a lot in environmental and, and geological sciences. So you do need to be quite careful about when you just have two sets of data. Does, just because they're correlated with each other doesn't mean that there's a kind of like a causal link between the two data sets. OK, and this is kind of a classic example, which is quite often quoted on the internet, that global warming is caused by pirates. Uh, so with, uh, if you plot up the number of pirates from like the 18th century to now, um, there's the uh, uh, number of pirates have gone down. It's not true. The number of pirates have probably stayed about the same. Uh, and then there's been an increase in global warming. Right? So if you plot the number of pirates against the uh, number of the amount of global warming, you get a correlation. Okay, but it's got nothing to do with it. Right? In fact, global warming might actually cause deprivation in a whole bunch of kind of like areas like Somalia, which might be related to the number of pirates. But uh, anyway, yeah, there's a there's a cartoon. For you. Okay, so yeah, this is the kind of like fire example, right? So there's a correlation between finding a fire and finding a firefighter. Does not imply a causal link between firefighters causing fires. Fires do, in fact, cause firefighters to appear. Um, so, um, so this is uh, yeah, this is another kind of like this happens quite a lot in kind of health studies. 
uh, that you might quite find if you eat lots and lots of fat, uh, then you're going to get lots and lots of cancer. Um, uh, uh, but when you actually kind of like pick apart some of this, then there might be other reasons why uh, fat intake correlates with something else. So other lifestyle choices, uh, inactivity. Um, uh, it might be that pe countries that have high fat intakes have got really, really good health care. Okay? Whereas low fat intake countries, really bad health care. So people die of other things before they die of cancer. Okay, so this just could be, uh, um, yeah. So this, although there is a kind of a nice correlation there that looks like eating lots of fat causes cancer, it might not be a causal relationship. Okay, there may be other factors at play. Um, I'm not going to talk about that.